and I repeat, there is no evidence anywhere of women being ordained deaconesses. Again, Mary must be seen as not only a symbol of motherhood, but of discipleship. As Mariology develops, so some of these feminists are claiming. As Mariology develops, it is not unlikely that the role of Mary will come to be seen as not only maternal, but priestly, and women will be able to imitate the mother of Christ as also a priest of Jesus Christ. Once again, sheer, unqualified, wild, unfounded speculation. Whatever Mary symbolizes, both in sacred scripture and the church's teaching over the centuries, it has never been, is not now, and never will be, that Mary will symbolize a priest of Jesus Christ. Number seven. No doubt, some of St. Paul's statements about women in the church are difficult. But modern exegesis is showing that Paul did not teach what he is charged with teaching, namely, men's rights to dominate women and women's required passivity. Rather, St. Paul stresses the complementary character of the Christian man and woman in Christ. As Pauline studies open still further horizons, the way will be open, it is claimed, for women's ordination to the priesthood. Not so. I keep repeating and insisting. In each example that I give, those who claim to be reading the Scriptures, or rather reading into the Scriptures, their own preconceived notions, and I repeat, built on Marxian philosophy. We might close this first section by saying that, with rare exception, those who promote the ordination of women to the Catholic priesthood, whether they admit it or not, whether they recognize it or not, are being used by those behind both Marxism and feminism. They are being used not to obtain liberation for women, just the opposite, to enslave them and make them pawns of ill-designing men, how well I know. The plain fact of salvation history is Christ's selectivity of men and men alone for ordination to the priesthood. This now is our third part laying down the doctrinal principles for why the Church believes and will never cease believing that only men can be ordained. We may approach these principles in two different ways. One is to evaluate on doctrinal grounds the arguments offered for the ordination of women to see how sound, or better, how unsound they really are. This is possible and needs to be done. I will not dwell on this side, but I think it should be brought to the surface. First, any ambiguity 
on the nature of the priesthood in the Catholic Church is sure to lead into doctrinal error. To so stress the ministerial or service function of the priesthood as to minimize the ritual or liturgical role of the priest is to reduce the priesthood to a mere ministry and remove that which is of the heart the essence of the priesthood in the Catholic Church. Namely, how this needs to be said, namely, Christ ordained apostles, all men, gave them the power to transmit their power to other men. And what are the two basic powers which the apostles received and passed on to their successors in the episcopate and the priesthood? The power of changing bread and wine into the living Jesus Christ, offering the sacrifice of the Mass, and the power to forgive sins in Christ's name. I remember serving as consultant to a theological commission of the American Baptist Convention. The leaders of the Baptists were studying the advisability of discontinuing all ordinations in that denomination. My strong advice to the Baptists in their convention was, I pleaded with them, retain your ordination, even though no sacrament is conferred and no sacred powers are received. But that is not the faith of historic Catholicism. Let me be brutally plain. The proponents of ordination of women in the Catholic Church concentrate on what they call the ministerial or pastoral benefits to be derived. What they are in search of and hungry for is power. These same people are remarkably silent about the advantages of a woman, and say not only a man, pronouncing the words of consecration or the formula of absolution. Secondly, any implication that the Catholic priesthood is a later development of the Church by the Church and not a sacrament instituted by Jesus Christ is an invitation to doctrinal chaos. If, contrary to the explicit teaching of the Church's magisterium, it was not Christ but the Church which established what be called the priesthood, then the ordination of women is a minor issue and of almost trivial consequence. In that case, the Church could not only ordain women, but could redefine ordination to exclude the power of offering the Eucharistic sacrifice or of changing bread and wine into the living body and blood of Christ. In fact, the Church then could, if it wished, discontinue ordination altogether. I asked, O oh Lord, whether I should say this, and I decided I should. This came home to me dramatically when I attended a Midwestern theological conference at which the Reverend Richard McBrien gave the keynote speech on the Catholic priesthood. McBrien for one solid hour, denied, as clearly as his English language will allow, denied that Jesus Christ 
institute of the priesthood. All the later 2nd and 3rd century development by the church. When he finished his talk, I thought somebody would make some objections. Nobody did. So I did. I stood up with my back turned to McBrien and talked to the hundred or so Catholic and Protestant theologians and pointing with my finger to McBrien. Everything that Father McBrien told you is heresy. And for ten minutes I explained what the Catholic Church really believes, which is contrary to what the McBrien was telling these people. You realize, therefore, it is the priesthood, the power, the power conferred by Jesus Christ to change bread and wine into his own living self and forgive sins in his name. That is the Catholic priesthood. And those promoting the ordination of women to the priesthood couldn't care less because, and I have to say this, so many of them no longer believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. And no wonder so many are promoting general absolution. We go on. On a more positive level, our doctrinal principles tell us some sobering facts that reduce the ordination of women to what it really is. Fervent speculation and zealous but groundless anticipation. The plain fact of salvation history is the selectivity by Christ and the early church. It is known that Jesus did not hesitate. What a safe statement. He did not hesitate to contravene the Mosaic law. Over that matter, the sociological customs of his day. Yet Jesus selected only men as his apostles, on whom alone he conferred the priestly powers of the Last Supper. From the beginning and all through her history, the Catholic Church has done the same. The unbroken practice tradition of the Church has excluded women from the Episcopal and priestly office. Theologians and canonists, building on the teaching of the Fathers, have been unanimous in considering this exclusion absolute and of divine origin. We therefore conclude of this constant tradition and practice of the divine law that it is of such a nature as to constitute a clear doctrine of the infallible ordinary magisterium of the Church. It is, therefore, irreversible Catholic teaching. From another perspective, suppose we took the opposite position, advocated by proponents of women's ordination. If the choice of men by Christ and by the Church has really been only time-conditioned, and changeable, then indeed some very unpleasant consequences could be drawn. This attempted solution proceeds from the idea that Jesus, if he had lived in another time and in another land, could also have chosen women. This theory thus grants that there could be another time or place in which women could be completely and appropriately given the fullness 
of the hierarchical and sacerdotal office. But then what follows? It follows, then, that the Catholic Church and her supposedly divine office of mediation of grace stand fixed in a social culture, that of the first century, which stands diametrically opposed to the ethos of the century in which the Church now lives. Grant this hypothesis, and no single teaching of Christ or of the Apostolic Church would remain normative for all times. Instead of transcending time, Christianity would become a slave of time. The Beatitudes and the whole Sermon on the Mount, the precept of monogamy, and the prohibition of adultery would become, as not a few are now urging, moral archaisms that had meaning and relevance in former days, but are no longer meaningful and certainly not mandatory in our day. Let me tell you, and I read their books. I know them. How well I know those promoting women's at ordination. These are the same people who will tell you that the whole moral order of Christianity is conditioned by time, and that no less than women can be ordained because this is the twentieth century. So, the moral laws which Christ came into the world and revealed to his followers to follow, all those moral laws can and should be changed. In fact, this is the principal theme of our Holy Father's masterful encyclical, Veritatis Splendor, on Christian morality, says the Holy Father. We are now living in an age when so many still calling themselves Christians and Catholics are telling us the whole moral order of Christianity is now out of date. And they, my friends, and they are the ones promoting women's ordination. My God! If someone objects the ordination of men by Christ and by the early church was simply a contingent and changeable fact that it could have been otherwise. Well, then we ask, since when are we Christians to stand in judgment on why God did what He did? like becoming man, when the world could have, absolutely speaking, been redeemed without the Incarnation? Or why does God do what He does, like nourish us with His own body and blood, when again, absolutely speaking, our spiritual life could be sustained better could have been sustained by other means if Christ had chosen other means. One of the great blessings I see coming from the present widespread propaganda in favor of the ordination of women is a deeper realization of the wisdom of God in providing for a variety of ways he can be loved, and a bewildering diversity of ministries by which he can be served. It is not for us to tell the loving God who became man what he should have done. He is God, not we. It is for us, therefore, to stand in awe, 
and not in judgment on the ways of God. Who chose a woman and not a man by whom to enter the world? If this was selectivity, and it was, it was not discrimination. God never does things without good reasons, even when these reasons escape or elude us. Who, would you believe it, sometimes want to instruct God? Lord Jesus, we believe it was by your divine wisdom that you chose to ordain only. We believe with the church you founded that the ordination of women is contrary to your will and therefore cannot be done. We beg you, dear Savior, to deepen our humility of faith in submitting our minds to your mind and trusting in your judgment over ours. If there is one woman, dear Jesus, who, if you were to ordain women, you surely would have ordained, it was your mother. Having chosen to ordain only men, your decision Dear Lord, we respect. We accept what you did, and we promise to help convert those who are blinded by prejudice or pride to the contrary. Amen. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you with his special graces.